this is Bob Sorrentino from Italian Roots and Genealogy. Be sure to check us out on YouTube and Facebook uh, and our podcast. And our great sponsors, uh, your Dolce Vita with Don Matera, Italy mm -hmm. Rooting with Letizia Sinisi, and Abiativo Casa with uh, Sabrina um, Franco. So Today we have a great guest from New York. I haven't interviewed somebody from New York in a long time, Maria Fosco. So yeah. welcome, Maria. Thanks for being here. Thank you. I appreciate this so much. Nice to so, see you. Yeah. So being a fellow New Yorker, where are you from? Um, I was born and raised in Astoria, Queens, in a very heavily um, Abruzzese community. Yeah. Ah, so you know Monte Cristi? I went to Monte Cristi. Oh, what year? I graduated in 1980. Oh, 69. Oh, that's great. I'm an old guy. See? Uh. <laughs> we paved the way. We paved the way for you youngsters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so how close did you live to, to Monte Cristi? Oh, it was uh, about a mile and a half. Um, I used to walk there. It was easier for me to walk than just to take the bus. But, you know, because I, uh, I lived on 18th Street in Astoria. Mm -hmm which is, you know, really, it was very, it's the very old section of Astoria and the very heavily Italian section. And uh, I grew up there. Yeah, and I'm, I'm going to guess that um, my uncle's wife, my aunt, aunt um, probably came from that same area. I, I vaguely remember going there when I was a kid, uh, so I can't recall everything, but I know her family was from Astoria. But I had to take a bus and two trains to get to Monte Cristi until I got my car. So I went from an hour and a half trip to down to about 20 minutes. Oh, wow. No, I used to walk it. It was a 20 minute walk. It wasn't too bad. No, that's that's great. Yeah, I used to walk, um, you know, from the from the R train. Uh, oh, yeah. And uh, uh, but I lived in College Point. So oh. it was like I said, it was a it was a trip. It was quite yeah. a trip. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so now growing up, um, you know, what was your neighborhood like? I mean, I, we, you know, we grew up in, in Corona, so I'm sure there's a lot of similarities. There are a lot of similar, similarities in Corona. Um, people in Corona come from, um, I forgot the name, Monte, Monte something in, in the region of uh, Salerno. That's where Monte people from um, Corona come from, uh, who've settled there. Where I come from, the Abruzzese settled where I come from, in the 18th Street, 14th Street uh, area, Astoria Boulevard. They were first the Salese, which is a, um, a town up near L'Aquila. And then the Orsognesi started to come. They they started to migrate and um, and settled in that area. So it was very heavy Italian Orsognese. Orsogno is a town where we come from. So uh, when I grew up, there were thousands of us there, thousands to the point, you know, we had a, a social club there. Actually, we had two social clubs on the same block of the same town. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Um, yeah, my mom, my mom is uh, Bares, uh, and uh, I had a lot of mix of different people because my father wound up there too, and his family was from Naples. Uh, but, you know, growing up, it's not, you know, these neighborhoods aren't like that anymore. You walk down the street and all you heard was Italian. Right. Absolutely. That's all you heard. And in fact, my mother never learned how to speak English because everyone around her spoke uh, Italian or dialect. The, um, the, the stores in the area were all Italian. Uh, be besides being Italian, many of them were from Abruzzo. So she even spoke dialect with them. Um, so she never learned to her dying day, never learned how to speak English, which was well, amazing. <laughs> yes, that, that is amazing. I mean, my grandparents, my um, my mom's mom spoke a little bit. My grandfather, not too much. Um, and my dad's family, I never recall my, my dad's mother speaking English. Um, yeah. she, we would go there on a Sunday and my father would just speak to her and, and uh, you know, the the Neapolitan dialect and, and that was mm -hmm. it. But my mom and dad always fought over who's, you know, whose Italian was correct. <laughs> <laughs> my sisters do that because they're both married to buddies. Uh, and that's they a whole both other actually, language. 
Yeah, it's all it's it's to the point that all right, today is actually my sister's 33rd wedding anniversary. And I, for the life of me, I still cannot understand my brother-in-laws. I have to ask my sisters, what did they say? Because they speak to each other in Buddy's dialect. And I just I have no clue. And my sister actually explained to me that the Buddy's dialect is also part German because it was taken over by Frederick the Great. And um and that's why there are a lot of blonde blue eyes people from body and a lot of their uh, body's words are actually German words. And I never knew that. I, this was explained to me by, by my sisters. Yeah. My grandmother had blue eyes, uh, but we were just there last week. Um, wow. Sorry to be back. Uh, but um, we, um, we had the driver, you know, that took us around. He, um, he was, we were talking to them about the language and he was, Say, would say something in Italian and they would say it in Bares and it was like not even close. <laughs> no, yeah, no, night and day, night and day. Yeah. yeah. Um, I know. So now, growing up in the Italian neighborhood, I mean, what sparked you to 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 do, you know, any research and follow up and, and what have you found? Um, I was always very interested in the Italian movement, the Italian American community. What motivated them to come here? When they got here, where did they live? What did they do for a living? Their migration patterns. I used to do a lot of studying in migration patterns. You know, um, communities from Little Italy, they move up, up to Harlem and then they moved up into the Bronx. Or from Little Italy, they moved to Brooklyn and then from Brooklyn to Long Island. And I always was very curious about why we were in Queens, well, Astoria, Queens. And I sort of realized that the, the mass migration of the Abruzzesi, the Orsognesi, was that they were working in, um, in construction, you know, building the bridges, the tunnels and whatever. So it was convenient for them to live in Astoria. And you ha I found another another issue, another situation. Many of the um, Abruzzesi who came, they were um, they were anarchists, and um, they were friends of Carlo Tresca. Carlo Tresca was a was an Abruzzese. He was from Sulmona, and um, he um, obviously he was killed here in Manhattan, but a lot of the anarchists moved to Astoria, the Abruzzesi. So one Abruzzesi brought another Abruzzesi. And I met an old elderly lady who was Orsognese, but her father was an anarchist. And she says, that's the reason why they moved to Astoria. So it was one Abruzzese brought in another one. And before you know it, you have a whole community. Of, let's say Abruzzese living in Astoria and uh, or you know like in Corona I, I've known that the Neapolitans um, lived in in, um, in Corona and like the Bronx a lot of the Bares lived in the Bronx and they they migrated to they migrated to Westchester a lot of those those Bares so uh, yeah I find I find this stuff fascinating I really really do yeah, so, no, yeah. me too. Me too. I wish I had started when I was younger. I only got started maybe 15 years ago or something like that. But you know, my grandfather um and and my uncles when they were younger, they were icemen and you know the bodies are no. Bodies were icemen in Coleman, men. yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh and I I can't figure out why, but uh it was funny because we were in uh we were in <clears> Bari <throat> and um I saw a bicycle with a you know big like I don't know, I don't think I don't maybe in a small motorbike i have a picture i'll have to check it out with a basket on the back that said ice man you know so yeah. it's like oh yeah a real body is the ice man <laughs> yeah i would love to learn about how they became the ice man and the cold man i mean and even to this day if you look if you ever speak to um anyone who owns those the uh, oil mm -hmm. trucks heating oil trucks mm -hmm. their descendants are buddies if you speak to them <laughs> If you, you know, talk to them and you, you know, ask them about their Italian heritage, they'll tell you they're buddies. So they went from ice to coal to now heating oil companies. So, so it's interesting how the movement goes. Yeah. And, and funny you mentioned that because my, uh, my uncle, uh, he was actually, I, I think he was Sicilian. Of course, my aunt was buddies, but um, he owned an oil company in, um, in Corona, minus yeah. fuel oil. Yeah. And, I, and I work with my cousin a couple of, couple of summers. Um, 
and uh, that was quite an interesting job for 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 sure. Um, so now you so you so you so we both your parents born in Italy. Yes, both my parents were born in Italy. They went through World War II in Italy. Um, my father arrived here in 1956 because really there was no, you know, Italy was going through a recession. They, there was no work there. And he settled in Astoria with all the other paisans. And um, he raised enough money to pay for my mother's passage. So she came in here in 58. She came two years later. And then they had my sister and bought a house. And then my twin sister and I were born. So, uh, but we always stayed in the same neighborhood. We never moved. Hmm. My father never moved. <laughs> Actually, it's only they moved. My mother moved after my father had passed. She moved about 20 years ago. And she went to live in another section of, the, of Queens, which was full of Orsognese. They sort of migrated to another part of Queens. <laughs> all at once <laughs> so that was another situ interesting situation because i said that i said you didn't you didn't really leave 18th street now you're on hazen street they're all the same they're all the <laughs> or so easy all your paisans are all lined up across the street and she goes that's why i moved here i wanted to still be with my paisans so. well that makes sense that makes sense you know my wife um my wife's mom um she grew up in little italy on spring street wow um, yeah. And so she, you know, they were right in the, in the heart of things. And, uh, um, you know, her uncle lived there and then, you know, until he passed away, he never moved. He never left Spring yeah. Street. Yeah, I, I don't, I, I get it. I, I do get it. I know. Yeah. And they found one bank account with $500,000 in it. Wow. Imagine. He never got married. <laughs> and he had one bank account. <laughs> That's something. Yeah, <laughs> I is. guess he was saving for a rainy day or something. Yeah. Like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So now I'm I'm going to assume you've been back, yeah? Italy? Yeah. Oh, I I go back actually every year at this point. My partner has a house, uh, literally actually in Arsonia, in the town where my family comes from. So he's from that area also, and uh, he has a house, and we go there. The, the house that my family had was sold. About 20 years ago, um, it was just falling apart. No one had lived in there since the 70s, since there, actually since like 68, 69. And it was time to get rid of the house. There was no point in um, in renovating it or whatever. Um, so we sold. Um, actually, the only thing we didn't sell was our land. And I actually went to see it about six years ago, I had never seen the land that, you know, the, that my family worked on because they had the house in the town and then they had the, the land outside the town with the Maseria. Maseria is the farmhouse. And when I went there, I saw the, the roof of the Maseria had collapsed. The, the building had collapsed and there was a landslide on the, you know, on the, on the land. Um, it was sad to see, but uh, we had still had that. But then um, because I'm registered in our town, since I'm an Italian citizen, the um, the the town administrator sent me a tax bill for ten thousand dollars <laughs> because I was the only living relative that that house was uh, that that land was attached to. And I, I said, this is crazy. I barely know where the land is and it's not even workable. And they said, well, we'll make a deal with you. Um, just we'll take back the land and just erase the tax bill. And we're, I said, fine, take take back the land. What am I going to do with it? You know, that was the end of that one. So, but um, I do go yeah, back every year. Plus, I've obviously, studied it. Really. Obviously, yeah. they just wanted the land. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they wanted the land, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, we went back to a few places last year. I mean, we had gone 25 years ago and hadn't been back and... Uh, now we went last year and we were going to this year and, and I'm, I'm working on the citizenship. I'm so bummed that I didn't do this sooner, but uh, hopefully we'll, I'll get it eventually. But um, I, I had a situation with um, my grandmother's uh, father's family um, we, and, and they had, he, they had a palazzo in Montebello and the, the place is, you know, big and um the the current owner let us go inside and um it was so sad i mean it was nice to go in but it was so sad because you could see what it once was yeah uh and now it's in such disrepair and and it, and 
the um the mayor and the council they wanted to buy it like 10 years ago and he he just won't sell it they wanted to fix it and i don't know make it a museum make it a hotel whatever they were going to do with it um but um you know those towns those couple of towns in calabria uh same situation we went down one street and it was just all empty houses with still with like you know bits and pieces of furniture and everything in it yeah uh and they told me that you know people from people have moved away and they work in germany or france yeah. or you know different places uh and they're hanging on to it but it, yeah. it, they don't do anything with it yeah no i know i know but, but we we did we were able to sell it we were lucky we found a buyer and who renovated it and i pass by every time and I, i'm sad because i you know it's my family time my my great grandmother bought that house she um, sold her dowry in order to buy that house because she did not want to live with her mother-in-law. <laughs> and at the time that she bought it, so this was like in the 1890s when she bought it, um, it was just a, a, a two-room two little hut. But it was in the town. You know, uh, obviously it was destroyed during the war. And uh, then my father worked as a, he baked bricks during right after the war under the Marshall Plan, mm -hmm. and in pay for, for payment, instead of money, they gave him bricks. And he was able to rebuild the house, and he rebuilt it, and it was like two, became three stories at one point. So it was a three-story house. Uh, it was like a townhouse type of thing. And, you know, when I was a kid, when we went back, we lived there. We stayed there. Um, but then, you know, when you get older, my sisters got married. Um, I had a career. I went to Italy all the time, but I really didn't go back to the town anymore. You know, my grandparents had passed. I hardly had any relatives there. And I, you know, and the, the house was in disarray. And so I really never went back. Um, so then when we got an offer, someone to buy the house and we just sold it. You know, there was really nothing we can do. My sisters said, you know, we're not going back to Italy and we're not going to be pouring money into a house in Italy. And I felt the same way. Like, I, you know, my, my life is here, you know. And it was a pretty big house to pour a lot of money into it. Yeah, but that's that's cool. So uh, so, so then your grandmother, she must have had a, she must have come from a fairly well-to-do family then to be able to have a dowry like that to purchase a house. Yeah. Not that the house was that much money, I suppose. But. Yeah, she did. My, um, this is my father's family. They were very wealthy landowners. And I, I only found this out. I did I didn't know that they were, you know, well off. I didn't know how well they were well off. And it wasn't until I went back in what 2017, 2018, that I spoke to someone who was a historian of the town. He said to me, You know, your great great grandfather owned the, the he showed me the part of the land and he told me the acreage. And I looked up the acreage and I converted it into American American acres. And it's the size of Central Park. Wow. And I said, it can't be. I said, this is, that, that it's, you know, it doesn't make any sense. He says, no, yeah, because we know what we're talking about. We've looked it up. It was the size of Central Park, the amount of land that they had. And then little by little, it was sold off piece by piece and then split up amongst, you know, other children and whatever until it was down to, to really nothing. And yeah, that, and then that's what the, that's the reason why my father's parents or my father's family never came here, not one of them, and it was because they were wealthy. Um, whereas my other great grandfathers all came here. This is prior to World War II, but they were birds of passage, meaning they came, they worked, and they went back. No one stayed, and I really couldn't understand this whole mentality of not staying. And I don't know it. I, I do know one great grandfather used to say, um, America will ruin your families if you stay. You know, your wives will be liberated. You know, you'll lose your culture. You'll lose your language or whatever. So I don't know if this was the mentality in those days or the mentality was just to come here, make money, and then go back there and buy. Um, because we didn't come from a family that stayed. You know, my, my father came in at 56. So we're here fairly recently compared to other Italian Americans. I hear all the, all, you know, I, I 
worked at the Kalandra Institute for 25 years. I was, you know, with the museum. I All the Italian Americans I worked with, their great grandfathers came here. They all came at the turn of the century or prior to World War One, or, you know, n no one, I was the, as far as Italian American, I was the youngest of the generations that came. I was the newly generation that came. I actually spoke Italian. And in fact, I was the only one in the office who spoke Italian. No one spoke Italian. And that you you understand the reason why that, because of World War II, they didn't teach the children the language and all that kind of stuff. Whereas um, by the 50s, that mentality was over. That didn't, that, um, it it was believed that you should teach your children Italian by the time the fifties and sixties came around. So my generation all speak Italian, all my cousins, we all speak Italian, you know, um, although I have cousins that don't speak Italian at all, which is very, very odd for us that like they couldn't communicate with their grandparents. Like, how can you not communicate with your grandparents? How can you not like have a conversation with your grandmother? And uh, I was very lucky. I was taught Italian. Well, Italian became my first language. It was originally my first language. Um, I really didn't learn English until I started going to school uh, because we only spoke Italian in the house. And my father was insistent that we speak Italian in the house. Um, he wanted to communicate with us. He wanted us to understand what was going on at the kitchen table. He wanted us to communicate with our grandparents. And my mother taught us how to write little letters to my grandparents in Italy. So we would write, you know, caro nonno, you know, buon Natale, you know, that kind of stuff. And so we would do that. That's the way I grew up. That's yeah. so great. I'm so bummed that they didn't teach us. Um, you know, I was, like you said, all my, all my mother's family, uh, with the exception of my one uncle who stayed behind in Italy when my grandparents came. And to your point, I think my grandparents had planned to go back. Uh, but then, you know, World War One had just happened. My grandmother yeah. had a, between World War One and, you know, the end of the war, I think she had at least two, if not three children. I mean, she was, you know, knocking them out pretty quick. Um, and so they didn't go back. And, um, you know, the, the interesting thing you mentioned about, about your um family with the land. That was my grandmother's family, my father's uh, mother. Um, when I look at the records uh, for for those people, it either says um, rich person. One thing actually says rich person. Uh, and a couple of the other ones say, you know, property owners and things like that. And they had land. Uh, they had land in several different places. And last count, my cousin Chinsi are over there found like uh, six or seven different properties in different parts of Italy. Um, and, but same thing, my grandmother uh, and her aunt were the only two from the family that came. And I never knew this. Nobody ever said it. Nobody ever mentioned how, what family was back in Italy. Uh, and now since then I found my dad's first cousins mm. still, still alive. I mean, it's just been an amazing experience for me to find people that no one ever talked about. Yeah, absolutely. I know. I, I just had this experience, this really weird experience. My grandmother's brother, her eldest brother came here in 1921. Uh, he was 17 years old. He um, worked here, got married here. He married a woman from Calabria, I believe. He died in 1946 at 42 years old. And the family just disappeared. They disappeared. He had three sons. We had no clue where they were. We just found them through ancestry, ancestry DNA. And we had a family reunion back in May. They didn't even know we existed. <laughs> we knew they existed. They didn't know we existed. And then I found records that they used to live down the block from us in Astoria. <laughs> they all had all moved to Florida. And we never heard from them again. So yeah, well, we had no Well, I ha I have a similar story with my cousin Linda. Um, like I said, the, you know, my my grandmother and, and her aunt were the only ones that came. Her my, my grandmother's aunt came in nineteen oh five and my grandmother came in nineteen fifteen. And um I never knew about this until I got contacted by Linda and she said, I think we're researching the same person, Maria Piromalo. And 
I think we might be related. I said, oh, we're definitely related. I said, Maria was my great grandfather's sister. Um, and, and she was like, are you sure? I said, I'm 100% positive. There's no question about this. And so she did ancestry. And of course, if we were a match, we're like, I guess, third cousins once removed or something mm -hmm. like that. But to your point, our families were tied at the hip until the 1960s. Yeah. Uh, and we never knew. I never knew about these people. And, and you know, as we we're discovering stuff, um, her grandmother was, we refer to her as Aunt Beatrice. Mm -hmm. I probably met her when I was very, very young. Maybe even met Linda for that for that matter. But um, when I married my first wife, we were going to look at an apartment that my cousin was vacating in Flushing. And we passed this house on Booth Memorial Avenue. And I remember my father saying, that's where Aunt Beatrice lives. And, you know, 20 years old, it went right over my head. <laughs> yeah. Um, so now I'm talking to Linda and she says, yes, we live, that's where we live. And my cousin Gene lived downstairs with his mother. And um, we used to, I used to be there every summer. And my apartment that my cousin vacated was five blocks away from Aunt Beatrice. Mm -hmm. Never knew. Uh, <laughs> Never knew. <laughs> and my cousins were like close with, with Gene's mother and my father. I, my father was a photographer for the Daily News. And I could see the pose of um, Jean's mom. And I think they got married in 1956 or something like that. And I said to him, I said, I get my father took that picture. I could tell yeah. from it that my mm -hmm. father, I could see the way she's posed. I, I'm sure my father took the, took the picture. And my grandfather ran a, um, a business. Um, they made bridal crowns in New York City and the bales and things. And um, when Linda, when we when we got to meet Linda, her mother, her grandmother had saved beads oh, from my wow. grandfather's store. And she brought us all beads. Um, wow. So, you know, these things are probably 80 years old, maybe 100 years old, who knows how. Still, old. yeah. But that's great. That's great. I love these kind of stories. I'm always asking people their, their stories, always. Well, you know, that's why I do this. People ask me, you know, I, I, I said, the stories are similar, but they're different. And everybody's got a different twist on things. You know, everybody's got something in their background that's similar, but also I'm intrigued by why people came. Me too. How they met people, you know, did they go back to Italy? What was it like when they went back? I mean, we went to Torito last week and they just... You're from Torito? Yeah, my grandmother, yeah. My, my brother-in-law's are both from Torito. Oh, really? Yeah. So, what's their last name? Carlu one is Carlucci and one is Macchia. I have Carlucci in the tree way, way back. I think I have some Macchia. Uh, my grand both my grandparents were Nicoletti, but they're not, they weren't related. Uh, okay, but yeah. They, both, they had the same name. Yeah, um, yeah we were just there and... and um, I'm going to have to send you my tree so you could send it to them. And we, uh, I'm sure we're related in somewhere down the line. <laughs> that um, is interesting. That's so they, they did, I went to the Torito uh, dinner dance. They had, they used to be in a, a, a Torito mutual aid society many years ago. And it was their hundredth anniversary. And this was about 25 years ago. And I went to their dinner dance in the Bronx. Oh, because that's they were so all neat. located in the Bronx. Yeah, I, I, they don't they don't exist anymore. But I believe they the Torites always have a uh, they have a, a picnic in New Jersey every year in June. Oh, I have to find about out it. about that. I have yeah. to I have to find out about that. Um, yeah, they they um um they actually had they actually had a small little house um on Via Cardona, if I'm saying it right. Yeah, I think that's right. Um. And in fact, the town historian just sent me, just today, sent me the, um, it says like the, um, like the, it's like a card or a, I guess, I don't know if it's a census type of thing, but it lists the people who lived in the house and it mm. showed my grandparents and my uncle. Uh, and um, that was really interesting, but yeah, I, I'll, I'll, 
we'll have to compare notes on that because that's so interesting. <laughs> yeah, um, they is. they were just so nice to us there. It was just great. Uh, my friend Letizia, um, she's from Puglia. She's from Bari. And last year she did our big tour and, and I was just going to go to Torito just to walk around. And she said, no, 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 you're not. I'm, I'm going to take care of everything. Don't worry about it. So we got to meet the mayor and they brought us into, you know, to, to records and they gave me the records of my, I had some, but they gave me the records of my um, great, great grandparents, mm. birth and death and marriage and things like that. Um, so that was really, really very exciting. Yeah. Um, so now I look at the wall behind you and I see all kinds of stuff. Oh yeah. <laughs> this is, this is my life. This is this is the, the life that uh, I don't know if I have or I had or but actually there are more. I have more in front of me and on the side and I even have some at home. Yeah, these are this is this is forty years worth of uh, work within the Italian American community. That's really what it is. Uh, That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Um, I have some stuff. On the other wall, you know, from our last trip that they, they had given us, we had come back. We had to buy a suitcase to bring back all the books that they gave us. And they were wow. all in Italian, so I'm struggling to get through some of them. <laughs> but every place we went, they were giving us a book or two books about the town, about mm -hmm. the history of the town and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so so now I know you also are or were involved in the new Italian-American museum going up in the, in New York City, correct? Well, I'm still on the board. I mean, I'm a founder. I'm still on the board. I was the administrator uh, up until 2008. Um, so I'm like waiting for it to open up again. Um, I, I have meetings with uh, Dr. Shelsa and the board occasionally. We have, we, you know, we have to make decisions on things. Um, I, I'm anxious to see it open. I mean, I it was it was my baby at one point, you know. Um, I remember Dr. Shelsa back in 2001 after 9-11, he had real reservations about it, whether or not we should go forward with it. We had just, we just, we had just been incorporated on June 12th. And so this was after 9-11, he said, with all that's going on in the world, I don't know if this has any value or if this is important enough and maybe we should just, you know, not do this project. Not because at that point we didn't have a building. We just had materials and the materials were from the exhibit. I'm sure he spoke to you about the exhibit, mm -hmm. the bit of New York, of the Italian Americans at the New York Historical Society. So we had all this material that people did not want back. They, they told us to keep it. So we had rooms and storage of space, rooms and rooms of all these, these wonderful items. Like my mother donated her grandmother's uh, sewing machine. And, you know, my mother, he said, I don't want it back. Keep it. And so that's how the museum was developed. Um, so we we convinced Dr. Shelsa to continue on. That was in 2001. And we did buy the building in 2008. They realized that the building was falling apart. So we made a decision to rebuild. So we tore that down and started rebuilding. It was supposed to have been up by 2020, but we all know the pandemic hit. Everything was at a standstill. And um, we had a meeting not too long ago, about a month ago. Um, we don't know if we're, we'll be open by the spring. We're trying. We're trying. Actually, I, I was prepared for us to be open for this Columbus Day, for Monday. That's how, you know, it was in my mind. We'll be open for Columbus Day of 2023. Um, obviously, it's not happening, but uh, luckily, we do have the funding for it. We have the funding to uh, to finish it. So I think that was my my fear that we didn't have the funding to finish it, but we do have it. So it's just a matter of time, and you know, of the contractors just moving it along, and uh, then we have to get back in there and you know, put up all our our exhibits and bring back all the items that are in storage and uh, I I think I don't know if he told you the the safe you know the, because the, the museum was the old Stabile Bank it had a gigantic safe in it and the safe was I don't even know how many years it was it was at least 150 years old it was monumental it was so heavy they had to get two cranes to get it out of the museum from 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 the ceiling from you know 
And apparently it's in storage in Chicago right now. And we, we have to get that back. You know, that's that's a that's a centerpiece of the museum. So uh exciting. Yeah, yeah that's that's so cool. Yeah, you know, I remember when I interviewed Dr. Shelsa that you know, it was like really supposed to be imminent. And and um like I said, I think I interviewed him was it had to be just before COVID. Because mm-hmm. uh, he was one of the he was one of the first interviews that I actually did because I wasn't doing the video then I was just doing the audio I believe, um, and uh, I was so excited to hear about it and you know so 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 for the people listening you know when it does open what kind of exhibits and what's going to be in there? Oh uh, well, we are going to put in the items that we had previously, which will be a permanent exhibit, um, and those are you know all like. You know, the the thongs from the Icemen. And uh, we have a gigantic book on, um, it was a great grandson of a, of a midwife gave us. So especially when it's from it, Little Italy. So it's a listing of all, where she registered all the ba- babies that she that she delivered in Little Italy. Um, they're just, they, that will be the permanent um, exhibit. And then I believe on the second floor, it will be um, a revolving exhibit. Uh, whoever, because as we we used to do this when we were at the Calandra Institute, we had an exhibit space, and we would have artists or certain, you know, like say like the the Caruso, the Caruso Museum. They had an exhibit there once, um, so it'll be changing exhibits on the the second floor, I believe. Second floor, yeah, yeah, and then I believe on the we have a terrace to have, have some events, and with, I believe we have a theater. So we're going to be doing a lot of things and it's going to be really exciting. I mean, you, you, you don't get to, it. it's something in life that a lot of people don't get to do. You don't get to say that you founded a museum, something that's permanent, that's a building, that's brick. And you could say, hey, I was part of that. Um, so, you know, that that's really my legacy with, um, in, in, in my life. I mean, I, Whatever work I do, I've always done it for the museum. I've done it for Italian Americans. I've, I've, I've loved. I love doing it, and um, I have so much pleasure in doing these things. Um, actually, I'm doing something for my family right now, which is interesting. For my birthday, which was a few months ago, my sister gave me a gift, and it was for to write up family stories, write family history. So each week I get a, a, a question emailed to me saying, what were your grandparents like? Something like that. And I would write up whatever I remember from my grandparents. And that, you know, I would finish that. Next week I get another question. You know, um, what did your house look like as a child? Or what did you do as a child? And, but I've been doing it and I've been writing about all the family history that I know of. And I, I believe my sister did this is because I'm the only one in the family who really knows the family history. Because I'm the only one who asks the question. It's really asking questions. That's all it is. And trying to write down, you know, a lot of times I went to Argentina to go speak to my great uncle. And I went there really because I wanted to speak to him about the family history. And he gave me a whole bunch of information. And I actually had to start writing everything down because I, I could never remember all of this. And, he, you know, so luckily I even used what he gave me in this. So I'm, right now I've written 15 chapters of this, you know, and each chapter is about seven, eight pages. You know, the chapters are small, you know, but what, what was your grandmother like? How did your parents meet? You know, all this kind of stuff. But I'm trying to go back in time as much as possible to 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 at least put it in writing for my own family about what our family was like, what we went through, who was who, what was what, and the little stories, the little anecdotes, the snippets. Um, my mother, my mother passed away in 2016, and I went to live with her for the six months prior that she she passed. I went to take care of her, and every day um, she would we would. She would sit up in bed. She was she had cancer, and you know she, but she was able to function. She was able to talk, and I would sit with her and ask her these just simple questions, you know. And all of a sudden, she would just flow. The information would just flow from her, and these are stories I never heard before. 
she never spoke about it. I mean, she told me that the first time that she went to her, her future mother-in-law's house, it was for her sister-in-law's wedding. And she actually described her outfit to me. <laughs> and, and, you know, I never heard the story before. And I, and, and then she, one story was, she was describing her wedding, the, the, the dinner at her wedding and, and what was served. I, I had never heard these kind of stories before. And, these little things. And then we were talking a lot about the war because she was a child during the war. And she never really talked about it because her mother was killed during the war. She didn't like to talk about it. What happened was a, a journalist got in touch with me and he wanted to interview children that went through the war. So as he was typing the, he was in Italy. So as he was typing me the questions, I would sit with her and ask her the questions and type back the answer. And I heard stories that were, just really heartbreaking, heartbreaking that she never spoke about. And in a way, I'm glad I wrote them. I wrote it down, them down for the for the journalist, but then I wrote them down for myself. So I wanted to record what she had said to me, what happened to her when she was 10 years old. And it was very important. And it's really important for us to know these things. A lot of people say, oh, why do we do this? Why do we go back in our ancestry? Why do we want to know who was our great, great grandfather? Who cares? Who cares? And I hear that all the time. It's very important that we learn what our family has gone through, especially if you have parents or grandparents that went through a war, that have been traumatized, that have P PTSD, that were taken, both my grandparents were taken, grandfathers were taken as prisoners of war. What my father went through when he was 14 years old during the war to keep his family alive and feed them. And, and then even to learn about like your great, great grandfather. I had a great, great grandfather who was a bounty hunter. Um, so, and here's the story. He was a bounty hunter, made a lot of money. He had a lot of businesses. He didn't trust anyone. But he had six daughters. So what did he do? He educated all his daughters. He made sure they had education. Okay. So these women were so highly educated that they became teachers. And in fact, if we, if we, because I pay attention to family, root family branches and all of that, everyone from that branch of cousins were are all educated. And that comes from the fact that the great grandmothers, the six of them were all educated. So they educated their children and the children educated their grandchildren and it goes generation by generation. So if you, so I always say it, see that generate, that, that branch of the family, they're all educated because of my great, great grandfather was a bounty hunter, didn't trust anyone and educated all his daughters. So this is the reason why you, you, you got to learn about your family. You have to learn. You have, and it's amazing what, what you what you hear, what you know. And it's, you know, it's let's say your grandfather's philosophy in life. Where did he get that? He got that from his father. Where did his father get that from? His father went through an experience. He went <clears throat> went through something else, and he's taught his son something. And these things get pe passed down through generations that we don't even realize that we're not even. We don't observe. We're not cognizant of these things. So it's it's very important to, to learn about your family. Very, very important. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I interviewed, um, and he's from College Point, too. I didn't know it at the, when I first met him, uh, Dr. Visco. And um, his great-grandfather <laughs> um, was a jeweler in Italy. And when he came to America, um, when he bought the house in the kids' room, he painted on the ceiling um, like a, you know, a microscope and, um, like the cover of a medical book and a few things like that. And he told all the kids, you're going to be doctors and the whole family are doctors or pharmacists yeah. or, you know, because he instilled that into yeah, them. So. Mm -hmm. Um, but to your point about the stories, I don't know if you ever heard of Anthony Riccio. Uh, he, he's passed away suddenly like a year and a half ago. He's such a wonderful guy. He's, he's written several books um but when he was uh just out of just out of college he became the advocate for italian americans in boston or, oh. or italians actually in boston uh in the 1970s and these are people these were people now who had come in 
late 1800s, early 1900s. They're all in their 70s. And he had the wherewithal to photograph and record their stories. Oh. And, and I'll send you some of them. The stories are just so profound and so deep because it's in their own words mm -hmm. from what it was like on a farm in Italy, why they came, what it was like in being in, in America during the war, uh, what their fathers were like, what their mothers were like. Just, uh, uh, you know, amazing. And um, <clears throat> one, one story that Anthony told was about uh, this, you know, a couple in America, uh, the, the, the husband worked, he was like a tenant farmer or something like that. Because we were talking about, you know, the men thought they were in charge, but really the women were in charge. Yeah. And <laughs> and the women were smart. They made the men think they were in charge. Yeah. But he was a tenant farmer and the and the man was selling the farm and, and he went to his wife and said, you know, he's selling the farm. I'd like to buy it, but he wants $75. I don't have $75. And she said, wait. And she went in. And she came out and had the $75 because she saved every dime, every nickel, whatever he gave her, she put away. So they were able to buy the farm. I mean, it's just, these stories are just amazing. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, there aren't a lot of us who get it. You know, we right. get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's extremely important. And, you know, it's funny because my twin sister, because I, I, I go through, went through my ancestry. I found my great, my grandfather from 1730s. And so my twin sister said, so now what are you going to do with that information? Who cares? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I told my sister, it matters. Everything matters. Everything, all this kind of information is very important to us. And then she was the one who gave me this gift on my birthday to write down the family history. Because I told her, this is extremely important to know this kind of stuff. A lot of people don't know. I, I mean, I met this distant cousin, you know, the family that, that disappeared when we had a family reunion. He knew nothing of his family, absolutely nothing. And it was so sad, absolutely sad. You miss on, on family history. You you miss on, on what your family went through. You miss out on the culture, your heritage, your legacy. You know nothing of your legacy then. Like, at least I have I have a sense of what my my family legacy was in in Italy. At least I have that. Um, a lot of people don't have this, and it's very very sad. It's uh, because then they they start to adopt other cultures and other heritages because they don't know anything about their own. Um, which is, you know, I guess if they want to, it's fine. But you know, like, why not? Why not embrace your own heritage? Um, it's so rich. Absolutely, yeah, and 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 that's why I do this because I feel that you know, as we go next generation, next generation, next generation, we're losing that. You know, we're losing our our history, our heritage. I mean, especially when you go when you go over to Italy and they're so deep into the heritage and the history and they're so proud of everything that they have, even these small little towns, mm -hmm. it's so foreign to us. Yes. And I tell people, you know, people say they, I'm going to go to Italy. Where are you going to go? Well, I'm going to go to Rome. I'm going to go to Florence. I'm going to, you're going to go to the hometown. No, I don't know. I don't know anybody there. Right. But that's where you're from. Oh, <laughs> right. Go. A lot of people don't even know where they're from. They yes. have no clue. If you ask them, they'll say, oh, somewhere in Naples, you know, they'll, and I'm like, well, what, what, you never went, you never asked, you never saw any documents, you never, you know, like, why don't you know? Well, how come you don't know where your family is from, you know? And for us, it was embedded in our minds. It was instilled where we came from. Uh, my parents were very proud of Brutsesi, very, very proud. I mean, you, you, I'd send you some of the pictures. They used to perform in a folkloric group representing Abruzzo. Uh, they went all over Italy. Um, they did a, an a Abruzzo tours uh, film I, I sent to you. And then when they came here, they were part of, of a, a folkloric group uh, from Orsonia. And in fact, I was part of that group because they needed... Um, they needed dancers and I could dance and I knew the, all the dances. So I was part of that for a good 15 years. I was part of that. And I, I, I sent you pictures also of that. Um, that was a lot of fun. 
I, I was dressed in costume from or Sonia from our town. And my mother made the costume. Part of the costume was very old. It was my great great grandmother's, you know, nightshirt and and the apron was old and whatever. But my mother had to recreate the rest of the costume. So I went all over the tri-state area performing, you know, especially during Ten Heritage and Culture Month. Um, and uh, it, it it was an experience. I met so many people from different communities. I met a lot of Italian Americans. I. I enjoyed it tremendously. Plus, and we sung the songs from Abruzzo, um, the dances. It was it was part of my existence, and it really made me what I what I am today. Um, I, I can't even describe the experience. And God forbid, some you know other girls or you know people my age did that. They wouldn't they wouldn't be caught dead doing that. They were like, "What? Get dressed up in costume, folklore costume, and go sing and perform with." in singing old Abruzzese folklore songs, they wouldn't be caught dead with doing that. Yeah. And yet I embraced it. I found it as an opportunity, um, get out of the house to perform, to dance, to do something. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it beyond belief. And it taught me a lot to be with people and, and how, I had to interact with the community and tell me everything about my own culture. And, you know, and it's a shame that other people don't know anything about their own culture. I not only do I know about my Italian culture, but I know about my Abruzzo culture, my Orsognese culture. I have tons of books on it that my uncle left me. And actually I fought with my sisters saying that I have to have the books. <laughs> you know, they wanted the books. I'm like, no, I get to keep the books. <laughs> uh, and in fact, um, for a family reunion, um, my cousin wanted me to write a history about Orsogna. The, our town that we come from. So I spent all of last summer, well, summer of 22, researching. So I went to every library. I pulled out every book. I emailed Italy or Sonia, if anybody can give me information and whatever. And I wrote a nice 10 page. No, it was more. What am I talking about? It's a good 20, 25 page uh, history on our Sonia, starting from the Roman times. And uh, we published it and handed it out to family members. It was a family reunion. We were over a hundred people, so um, that was that was nice. And I, I really loved doing it. I didn't know any. I I knew the history of Orsonia, but I only knew maybe up until maybe from two three hundred years ago. I didn't know anything prior to that. I didn't know that it was really a Roman town. I had no clue about that and why it was geographically positioned where it was. I had no clue about that. And then in my research, I found everything out. It was part of the, the path of the Transuanza, the, where the sheep go from Bari all the way up to L'Aquila. Every mm -hmm. year, every season, the shepherds bring, you know, bring their flock up north during the summer and down south during the winter. So our town was smack in the middle, so they would pass, pass us by. And in passing us by, we a town was developed there. So I, I, I found that very interesting, you know. So and that goes back to the Roman times. Yeah, and I learned about that when we were in Capricota because um, they showed us the same thing. They showed us the sheep path where they would go from Capricota in the mountains down into Puglia, mm -hmm. uh, you know, every summer. And it was like so interesting. And in fact, we went to a restaurant and they, they made us a meal that the shepherds would eat you know similar to what not exactly yeah. but you know yeah uh, this similar kind of thing that they would eat which was which was pretty um which was really pretty neat and um I, i'll i'll have to I'll, I'll send you uh a couple of those things from anthony though i think you'd be really interested in it yeah i would be was, very interested he yeah. was such a uh it was so sad he was such a wonderful guy and and i only knew him i don't know maybe six months but Everybody who met Anthony came away with the same feeling that this was a man dedicated to his Italian heritage uh, and that he would do anything to, you know, propagate the the, the history of, of the people who came from Italy into America, uh, mostly in Boston, because that's where he was from. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just a just a super, super guy. Um, no question about it. Um 
Well, listen, this has been so much fun. I mean, I think we could probably do another three hours here. Oh, yes, <laughs> probably. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, certainly looking forward to the museum opening. And, um, you know, once it, you know, let me know when it opens, either you or Dr. Shelsa, so I could put oh, yeah, it Yeah, we'll be there. putting out press releases and all of that. It'll be all over the place when we open. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so. Well, thanks again. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you.